All right, you ready? Lord, I choose to obey your word, for as I dwell and walk in your presence, I shall not lack. Poverty be far from me and my household in Jesus' name. I will walk in your blessings, Lord. I will rise above all that hell has to offer and accept heaven's best here on earth. Everything I set my hands to will prosper because I make you my dwelling place. You are my refuge and my fortress. For your provision, I accept it by faith, fully expecting your blessings in every area of my life. For wherever your presence is, there is no lack. Therefore, Lord, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for abundant harvest, health, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, scholarships and grants, inventions with royalties, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase, bargains, and child support. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs, that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to go back. I want to talk about relationship a little bit more, but I've had this thought on my mind all week, and it's about communication. And um, so I made a lot of notes today. I started to do our old-time confession, you know, over class, because I used to do it before we taught all the time. You know, what is this? This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus' name. And uh, so I'm going to do a little teaching today with the sermon. i give you some, if you don't have pen and paper, I've always encouraged people to bring pen and paper, take some notes. I, I love it when I can plant something in your mind and in your heart, but also love it when people take notes because you learn more when you take notes than you do any other way. I learned that when I was children's church director with kids. And you, you could break a lesson down. You could teach a, a lesson for 30 minutes and teach children, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, it, for 30 minutes. And they might remember that a, a whale swallowed Jonah, you know. I mean, that'd be it. That'd be the gist of it. But if you taught a five-minute lesson, showed them a 10-minute video, let them color four pages, and had a couple worksheets where they kept seeing it, hearing it, doing it, they would retain way much more, so much more. And uh, you know what? Children grow up and become adults with the same learning capacity. So it's the same way. I could preach for an hour and a half, and uh, you're only going to go home with just a short segment of the sermon, whether it's a 30-minute sermon, an hour sermon, or an hour and a half sermon. But when you take notes, when you hear it, you write it down, you see it, and when you, when you write something down, you read it. So you're entertaining that same word not just once, but twice, three times, four times. And then if you happen to go back and look at your notes, then you're, you're doing it all over again. So that's one reason why that I encourage. I, I remember 30 years ago when I first began to preach that I, was, I talked with God about, uh, God, how's this going to work? And uh, he said, my people don't need preach that. They've been beat over the nose coming to the trough their whole life. They need taught. They don't know how to live. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to trust. They don't have faith. They don't believe. Wow. And so we've always included a lots of teaching in our ministry, Susan and I both. So most of you guys already know that anyway. But, you know, and uh, um, there, I don't know how much this that got recorded, a lot of it probably. So there may be a lot of notes up on screen today. In James chapter 4, verse 2, it says, We have not because we ask, we ask not. Remember that scripture? Yeah. And then if you go beyond that, it says you ask amiss that you might consume it. A lot of times when we're talking with God, we're asking for things, we're desiring things that maybe is not in God's will for us to have. But the, the truth, the real truth, they are putting, um, what is it? The, the plum in the, no, I forget what it is. It didn't come to me, so I'm not going to share it. But the real truth is that uh, communication, all right, now there's part of that scripture, you have not because you ask not. So you know how that goes. There are a lot of times uh, we never ask, you know, people say, boy, I, I guess I need a new job. I'm not making enough money. And you say, what well, did you ask for a raise? No, I didn't ask for a raise. Well, how do you expect to get something if you don't ask for it? Right. 
Maybe, you know, it's a kid and you'd like to have a cookie out of the cookie jar. Right. And, you, and you'll come there stealing it than you would asking for it. Oh. Anybody ever been there? Mm-hmm. Anybody ever stole something that you was afraid to ask for because you thought you would get a no answer? You know what? The devil planted that seed in us when we were young. And as we grew older, that seed matured wow. and began to produce. And it got to where even after we got saved, that we were still cautious when it come to asking for something because there was a fear element in there that said, well, you're not going to get it. And so, again, for years we've tried to teach you that God wants to bless you. God wants to answer your prayers. He said, you have not because you ask not. Ask. Okay? Ask and you shall receive. Matthew 7, 7. We share that one a lot of times. Knock and it shall be open. Seek and you shall find. But see, the, the thing about relationship, we've talked a lot about that this year, is that relationship requires communication. Yes. People, you know, they'll say, how long you been married? And I say, oh, well, almost 47 years. To the same woman? Yeah, to the same woman. How'd you do it? Well, we've always been able to communicate. Even when we were mad at each other, you might communicate on a higher level. You know, uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you might get louder with your words when you're angry, but still there was communication. Wow. When Susan and I got married, uh, Joe Williams, he said, he made this statement. He said, don't ever go to bed mad. And what he was trying to say was, you need to talk your problems out before you sleep on it. Mm-hmm. Well, the truth is, I can go to sleep, and it's, I forgot what I was arguing about the day before, so it didn't work so good for me. But for most people, it works real good. And in most circumstances, it's way better to just go ahead and spit it out, get what needs to be said said, whether you're talking to a person, whether you're talking to your dog you're trying to train, or especially if you're talking to God. There are some spiritual laws, and this is one of them, that communication is required for a relationship. If you went and adopted a pet, and you stuck it in a pen, and all you ever did was go out there and uh, run some water over a water hose into its trough and throw some dog food in it or cat food, depending upon what kind of pet that you got, and never uh, talked with it, you'd never have a relationship with that animal. It'd be wanting one, but it wouldn't be there. You can go to work, work with people, and if you don't like them and you don't talk to them, you won't have a relationship with that individual. It requires communication to have relationships. So if you're here today, and some of you are, you're young, you're, and most of you in this room have been married for a while, um, some of you only a year, but let me tell you, communication requires relationship, or relationship requires communication. The more you can communicate, your ideas, your thoughts, and your feelings to whomever that it may be, the better off that both of you are going to be. Know that. Now, communication means that somebody is speaking, somebody is hearing, and somebody is responding, and then there's normally a return cycle to that where somebody else who responded speaks, somebody else has got to listen, okay, and then there will be another response. It's, it, it's a cycle that just got to be completed. Speaking, hearing, responding. Now, you know, there are those that you can talk to and they got deaf ears and they don't pay any attention to you. And so instead of them responding, sometimes you will respond. Now that's when we get into trouble. When we do the talking, then we do the responding without them doing their part. They've got it. People got to hear and the ones that's here is the ones who need to respond. So now know this. When you talk with God, you ask, that's speaking, you're communicating with God. All that prayer is is communicating with God. We call it prayer because instead of it being with an individual, it's with the deity, it's with God himself sitting on a throne. So anytime that we are speaking with words that come out of our mouth addressed to God, it's prayer regardless of how that it comes out, okay? It can be something that we're singing, it can be something that we're saying, but it's still prayer, it's still communicating. The biggest weakness and fault that there is within believers and the church is the lack of communication. We can preach on relationship, relationship, you got to have relationship, are you in relationship? Do you know God? Does God know you? Yes, He does. But do you know God? Do you talk with God? Do you hear God? Do you respond to God? Because God hears, God is speaking to you and I, 
but we don't always hear, and if we don't hear, we don't respond. So we've got to work on our communication skills with God, and when we can, when we can fine-tune those with God, we'll fine-tune them with people. A lot of people don't have good relationship skills because they don't have good communication skills. They're people that we work with. And I, it's never been more evident to me than it has in the last year or two at work. Because let me tell you, with a job like we have in the spring, communication is everything. It's everything. You get 17, 18 men and trucks trying to dispatch them, going here and there, and nobody knows where they're going, and they don't know how to get there, and they don't know when they're going to show up, and you don't know. you got to have lots of information. There has to be a lot of communication. Yeah. Now, there are different levels of communication, of course, and when I, I don't have time to preach all of this or teach all of it, but there's the words that we say. Sometimes it's the look that we give. I can communicate laughter just, all right, without saying a word. I can also communicate anger without saying a word. Can I not? Yes. So can you. See, there's, there's another level there. And don't forget, people are watching you. Not only are we, they listening to what we say, they're watching to what we're not saying, but the words are still there. Yes. And then, of course, there is written communication. Mm -hmm. Listen, uh, I know when Susan and I were dating, I wrote her lots of love letters. They were so sweet. I, I'm telling you, I was good at it, too. I could have taught people how to write love letters to their girlfriend. I knew all the right words, didn't I? How did I get such a pretty woman? I knew how to communicate. <laughs> Amen. And it developed a relationship, one that's now lasted for close to 50 years. My goodness, wow, that makes me sound old, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, that's because I am getting there. Now, this is the year the unimaginable. Know this, communication is vital to the unimaginable. If you cannot communicate what you want God to do, then the unimaginable will never happen. We have to be able to talk with God him hear us, respond to what we're saying in a way in which we can hear and respond to Him because for the unimaginable to take place, God's going to do His part. We know that already, right? But we still have to do our part. You know, when Elijah went up that day to, call, to pray fire down from heaven to destroy the 12 barrels of water and the altar and the sacrifices that were there, listen, he prayed first. He communicated with God. He said, now God... We got a job here to do. And you know what? God heard him, did he not? And when God heard him, all right, then he responded. But wait just a second. He didn't respond until Elijah prayed a 63-word prayer. So did he just come up with that on his own all at once? Don't you think that Elijah heard back from heaven? and God just filled his mouth with a 63-word prayer, and before he got the amen out at the end, God responded to what he had asked, what needed to be accomplished, and the unimaginable thing took place right before everyone's eyes. Because there was a communication between Elijah and between God, and then between God and Elijah, and everybody witnessed the unimaginable. So it's very obvious to me as pastor and individual that many times we are not experiencing what God wants the body of Christ to experience because we're failing on a communication level. We're failing. It's not about not asking, probably. And then sometimes it is because a lot of people, they just don't ask. You know why you don't ask? Because we don't always believe. We know enough in our heart the devil will remind us whatever we ask in faith, believing we shall receive. And so when we want to ask something, we, we question. We don't question God. How many of you believe that God can do anything? Everybody in the room? So we're not questioning God, then who are we questioning? We're questioning ourselves. Is my faith there? Can I believe? Will God do it for me? See, we question ourselves. So then we fail to communicate what our desire is to God. We fail to even ask. It's like, well, I can't believe for it anyway, so there ain't no need of me asking. You know what? That is a, a wrong attitude to have. It's a wrong one to have. I'm telling you, we are to ask. God knows what we have need of before we ask. 
He knows our heart's desire, does he not? And he told us to ask. Now, God will respond in different ways, but we just got to know that. Now, understand again that communication is key to the unimaginable. I thought about Joshua, because we already know that Joshua is in a relationship with God. We preached on him a couple of times earlier in the year. Listen, he crossed the Jordan River with Caleb. They went over and the walls of Jericho fell down flat. They won every battle but one because sin was in the camp. And then from then on, they won them all. Now, you know what? Let's read this one. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still upon Gibeon. And thou, moon, in the valley of Agilon. Now, if you never heard that before, read that before, it's the only time in the history of mankind that the sun and the moon stood in place and did not move until Elijah's army won the whole battle. And then when the battle was won, then the sun began to move and the moon began to move again. And in case you don't know that, that is not only a, a fact that comes out of God's Word, but NASA proved it. NASA proved it. They were trying to distinguish when they could send rockets through Earth's gravity and the times were off and their computers couldn't figure. And they had a Christian engineer at NASA and he said, I'll tell you what's wrong. Holy Spirit says you got to go back to Joshua chapter number whatever it was 10 verses 12 through 14 because God stopped the sun and the moon and when you recalculate the time then we'll have it down pat and they've never missed a window to space again. You know what? The unimaginable happened for Joshua because he was able to communicate to God. God, I need you to do something here. As long as we're, we're winning this battle, we need to win it. The sun doesn't need to go down on us. And so when he got done talking, what did he do? The sun stood still. God responded to Joshua's prayer. Yes, he did. For a whole day, mm -hmm. they had to figure it in. That's right. See, communication is key. You want to have a good marriage? How many of you are married in this room today? You want to have a good marriage? All right, communication. Without it, you'll never have one. You want to be a good parent? Learn how to talk to your children. And you know what? That gets tough when they get to be teenagers because they don't want to tell you about things that are going in their life. But when you establish a good relationship with your young people when they're 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, when they're 14, 15, 16, and they're going through crises at school, crises with girlfriends, crises with boyfriends, they'll know that they've got somebody they can come to and they can talk about anything and you won't laugh at them and you, you'll listen to them with your heart and you'll remember that you went through it when you were a teenager and you'll have compassion for your own because you're in relationship with your own and you'll love your child and your child will love you and instead of having all that rebellion that can build up within them, it won't be there. And you know what we do sometimes? We, oh, I was a good parent. I'll tell you how good your parent is by telling you how good your children turned out. Right. Now that might hurt a little bit. If it does, blame God. Don't blame me because God's the one put it in my mouth. Sure, I think as a parent, most of us realize I made a few mistakes. I could have done better. I should have done better. I didn't pray with them like I should have. I didn't take them to church sometimes when I should have. I let them boss me around when I shouldn't have. I didn't spank their butt when I should have. It didn't do any good, Spank Davis. We had come up with a whole alternative means for discipline. Poor Tory, we love you. Thank you for taking our son under your wing. Thank God. Amen. But when you're in relationship, you learn each other. And sometimes your kid knows you better than you know yourself. Because you got all tied up, busy doing your own thing, working, making a living. Uh, all this stuff and your kids watching you. Yeah. And don't forget something. Your kids watching you right now. That's right. And they watch you when the preacher's preaching and they watch you when the choir's singing That's and they watch you when you come to church and they watch you when you leave church. Yep. If you don't think they won't do what you do later on, then you're probably going yeah. probably gonna to miss it. Yep. Joshua spoke, God heard and God responded. That's the way you communicate. 
Anybody need a miracle in their life? We all do. We all need miracles. It'll be a miracle for us to get some of our people saved that need to be saved. It's, it looks like it's going to require something beyond the norm in the world that we've got into now, this day and time in which we're living. And here's something that I, I know, uh, I've always known. When communication failed, nothing works well. Yeah. Things begin to go haywire. Yeah. And you know what? We've, we've heard this our whole life. Susan and I share it all the time. But Proverbs 18.21 says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. You guys know that, right? Life and death and power of the tongue. So how can I produce life? I do it with my tongue. See, the power of the tongue is the ability to communicate. The power is in the words that the mouth speaks. So the better that I am able to communicate what needs to be said, the better that life's going to go for me and for every, everything else, everybody else. That's why we study learn, to learn the Word so we know what to say and how to say it, when to say it, where to say it, when to pray it, when not to pray it, when not to say it. We speak life into a relationship when we communicate well. And you know what? If you don't communicate well within the relationship, you're speaking death to it. wonder how many marriages have been dissolved in our lifetime because the man and the woman did not communicate together. They did not speak life over each other. They did not pray life over each other. They did not ask God how to handle the situations that they were into. When I marry couples, I tell them, but if you'll put God in this marriage, it cannot fail. Because God cannot fail. If you leave God out of this marriage, it's destined to fail. Now that can be harsh words to young people that's just fixing to get married. How can, they, how can they stand without God in this society today? Very few are going to make it without God. You know why? Because it's hard to make it with God because people have not been taught how to communicate to one another, to speak softly, soft words, turns away wrath. They don't know how to say I'm sorry. They don't know how to repent for being mean or being evil, to do good things, say good things, sow good seed, Produce life within a relationship. My parents didn't know how to do it. I'm the odd child, I'm telling you. My wife, she can tell you, my family. I, I was the hugger, I was the kisser, and I was the one who said, I love you. Can I remember my dad or mom ever telling me that they loved me? Not till I started it. And when I'd say, I love you, they'd say, I love you too, son. I taught my parents how to communicate love back to me. And in so doing, I taught them how to communicate love back to my siblings. And my siblings didn't know how to handle it hardly. It's like we knew it, but we never heard them say it. Listen, there's, life is in the saying of the words. It produces life, not death. People don't wonder, they don't question. Did my parents really love me or not? They never told me they loved me. Sometimes they acted like it. Sometimes they acted like they didn't. I'm, I don't know how you grew up. I know how I grew up. And I knew that in our family, we did not communicate well, and I've watched it in the lives of many other people. The, the dad didn't know how to communicate to the mom, the mom to the dad. But you know what? They had something. They would not divorce because they was taught right and not wrong. They lived good lives, moral lives, but they still could not communicate well together. It's harder now than it's ever been. It's more vital now than it ever was. You can speak life into any relationship that you have because you have the power of words at your disposal. And in the multitude of what? Words. Okay. There's either much sin or there's much love. In a multitude of words. Solomon said in one place, he said, show me somebody that talks a lot, I'll show you somebody that sins a lot. Right. And that happens a lot of cases. Yes. A lot of cases. Right. But when we learn how to control our words and we speak life, and we, it'll produce life. And you know what? When there's no communication, you know what happens in a, in a ditch that has no outlet? Susan taught on the Dead Sea the other day, other night. Some of you weren't here, missed it Wednesday night. The Dead Sea is dead. How come? It doesn't communicate. It stagnates in the Dead Sea and everything dies 
because it comes in and it stops. It's not communicating. The Jordan River feeds it. It has an outlet. The Jordan River feeds into the Dead Sea. Sea. It comes in out of the mountains over there. It's got life in it. It's communicating what it receives and, and responding by putting it out. We come to church to learn so that we can go back out on the street and share what we learned and live it in our life. Communicate what we hear. We read and study God's Word so we can communicate what we hear. And when we communicate what we hear, we're building relationships with people. All the while building a better relationship with God. For the most part, most Christians have a better relationship with somebody than they do with the Father. And that's, that's not right. But when we can have a relationship with Father like we're supposed to have, listen, good things are going to happen. Right. All right? So if we fail to sow, uh, it's because we failed to speak. Failing to speak is failing to sow. It's failing. Remember, you sow failure by failing to speak. It's easier if I read it off that page than this one. That one's plain. This one ain't. You sow failure by failing to speak. You can't have a harvest unless you sow something good. So if I'm not putting good seed out, if I'm not putting no seed out, then probably nothing is going to happen. I thought about, all week I thought about Sarah and Hagar. How many of you know Hagar's story? I think Susan needs to preach that probably this summer when she goes to pop her bluff. You know that Hagar was Sarah's handmaid. Abraham didn't have a seed. So Sarah gets it within herself. I'll just give my handmaid to Abraham to be his wife as well, and she can bear him a son. Did she talk with God about it? Was that in God's plan? No, God had a plan. So when Sarah got old enough to have children at 90, okay, and she was going to have a son, this is about 14 years prior to that. She ain't old enough yet. She's only 76 at the time, I believe. So, Hagar gets pregnant, and then Sarah gets mad. And she's mean to her, and she runs off. Hagar leaves. She she escapes. She's out of her own country. She has nowhere to go. She's pregnant. She's alone out in this wilderness, and God comes to her. And Hagar and God communicated together. She listened he, she prayed. She cried in the wilderness. God heard her. He said, what are you crying about, Hagar? Yep. She told him what was going on. He already knew it. He said, you go back. Yes. You go back. Yes. You're going to have a son. I'm going to make of that son, Abraham's seed by the handmaid, a great nation. Listen, this world has been troubled ever since. That's right. The Arab nation was born out of Hagar's seed, Ishmael, against the Jewish nation. And we have wars that take place ever since because of it. Yep. Why? Because Sarah failed to communicate with God yep. and did not allow God to respond. Yep. See, the failure to communicate can create great problems in people's lives. That's where all this family structure fails. It's where churches fail. Churches that fail to communicate close their doors and they're burying them out in the fields and I'm spreading fertilizer on top of them. That's true. And if you don't think that doesn't sadden my heart when I go to a place and I'm like, where did the building go? Where did the church go? They failed to communicate with God and when they did, they failed to communicate with God's people, with each other. Their families failed, faltered, church faltered, it's gone because they failed to communicate. And if you and I, if we fail to communicate in this world, we're asking for problems. We're asking for failure. Does anybody want to fail on a regular basis? No. No. None of us do. We want to exceed. Do we not excel and exceed in everything that we do? Let me give you, let me give you six things real quickly. Okay? <clears throat> six things when it comes to praying. Number one, pray regularly. Become as regular as sitting down and eating a meal. You hear me? There are things that you do every day, like clockwork, and you don't even think about it. Every day. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you comb your hair, you wash your face, take a shower, whatever that it is, you dress yourself accordingly to the day, you go to work, you're, you're, 
most everything about your life is preset. And you do it on a regular basis. Do you not? Yes. Do you know that maybe number one priority for all of us should be I need to set some goals with my prayer life so that I communicate with God on a regular basis. You hear me? Yes. It's a goal because most people don't do it. We do it when we feel bad. We do it when we think about it. We do it when something's going on. We do it when somebody says, you need to pray for me. We do it when we're prodded, poked, and pushed into it. But it needs to be as regular as anything else that we do. This is who we are. This is what I do. Okay? You know, if somebody said, well, what do you do in life, Brother Dale? Well, you know, I, I take care of the house. I take care of the... I work for MFA. I, I eat three meals plus snacks every day, right? Amen? I pray regularly. Do you ever tell somebody, oh, I, I don't spend a day without praying. I don't spend a day without praying. It ought to be as regular as sleeping. I don't spend a night without sleeping. Let me tell you, when nighttime comes, I'm going to go to sleep. When morning comes, I'm going to pray. How about that? Because I'm going to make it regular. I'm going to get so used to doing it that I do it on a regular basis. Amen? You know that Daniel did it how, how many times? Three times, Three times a day. Oh, Daniel prayed. Morning, noon, and night. When they threatened to throw him in the lion's den, what did he do? He prayed anyway. Turned his face to the eastern wall. They standing outside watching him, seeing what old Daniel's going to do. Old Daniel said, hey, listen, I serve a God who's able. I know a God who can. I know a God who does the unimaginable. I know a God who can deliver me from a lion's mouth. I'm going to pray. It's what I do. It's who I am. See, that's the way we are to be. This is who I am. This is what I do. You can't keep me from praying. I wasn't very old when they took prayer out of school, but I was smart enough to know that you cannot keep somebody from praying in school. And they can't keep you from praying at work. And they can't keep you... Verses 16 and 17, he said the same thing. He said, as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. That's verse 16. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. He's saying, I communicate with the Father. I do it in the morning. I do it at lunch. I do it in the evening. And if something comes up in between, I snack on it. He said, well, I'm regular. Mm -hmm. So next time somebody asks you about it, tell them you're regular. Yes, and they'll want to, then you get to explain mm -hmm. why you're regular. Yes. How about that? Mm -hmm. The number two, pray honestly. Come on, church, let's get real honest. Say what you think and how you feel. Because God already knows. Nothing is hidden from God. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 3, I think that's probably a 9. Might have been a 4. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It was 413. See, he already knows. He knows if you're mad. He knows if you're happy. He knows if you're frustrated. He knows if you're sad. He knows you. So be as honest with him as what you possibly can. If you're angry with God, tell him, God, I'm upset here. God, this ain't the way I thought this should go. God, I don't get this. Tell me what's going on. Be honest with them. He knows it already. He knows why you're mad. He knows why you shouldn't be mad. Or he knows why you should be mad. And then listen so that you can have a response. Because he's going to respond. When you're happy, pray. When you're sad, pray. When you're distraught, pray. When things are going good, thank God. That's prayer. When things are going bad, cry. Right. Tears are a language that God understands. Right. See, it doesn't matter what you're going through, what your day is like, what happened, what your husband's... God helped me to understand why he did that so that I can change situations so that he doesn't... I'm going to cover him. Yes. 
That's why we pray. We don't pray to get even. We don't pray to, to keep us from having resentment. We pray to keep us from having resentment because if you don't pray and turn it over and let God respond to what's going on in your life, you'll begin to question and wonder. You'll question God, wonder why God allowed that to happen. Things are going to happen we don't understand. Know that. Things happen all the time. Why did that young man die in that car wreck? Well, we don't understand exactly why. But we do know that one God. This person's got cancer. Did God do it? No. That young man that hung himself a few years ago when I preached his funeral had every reason in the world to live. Why did it happen? Because the devil got in his head. That's why it happened. I know why that one happened. He didn't know how to communicate his feelings to God. How many people do we know today who do not know how to communicate their feelings, their true feelings, to God or to someone else? There are people who can't even talk to their spouses because they can't communicate their true feelings. So then they can't work out a problem. Can't be honest? Just talk. Okay. Oh, that's what I just said, wasn't it? Pray honestly. Yeah. How can a husband pray for his wife if she can't communicate her feelings? Because women are more emotional than men, right? But you know what? Men are worse than the woman. Men have a harder time communicating their feelings to their wife than what the wife does to the husband. We do. Just take it like a man. That means don't cry in front of them, right? But you know what? You need to cry in front of them. If that's what you're feeling, don't close up. Don't clam up. Don't hide out. Don't push away. Communicate. If you can't say what needs to be said, just hold somebody and let them, let them work it out. Nothing's hidden with God and nothing needs to be hidden unless God says to hide it. Nothing. The third thing the Bible teaches us is to pray fervently. That's in James 5, 16. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man healeth, availeth much. Fervent. That means the, uh, what's important to you means that it's important to pray about it. And it's important to pray according to how important that it is. Do you know what I'm saying? If you, sometimes you've got to get serious with prayer. Okay? If, we, if people hadn't got serious with prayer, communicating with God on a deeper level, Sister Deronda might not be with us today. That's right. That's right. Yep. And you know what? The sad thing is, there's no telling how many people in this world are not with us today because people didn't know how to get fervent in prayer and communicate from deep. Deep should be crying out to deep when it's a deep mess that somebody's in, whether it's us or somebody else. When I was down and out, there was a lot of fervent prayer that was prayed for Brother Dale. A lot of it. If there hadn't been, if people hadn't taken it seriously, then I might not have been with you today to tell you to pray fervently. Know it. There's some things that are more important than other things. Some things require more than what other things require. Sometimes you can just pass through something pretty quickly. God, I need you to help me take care of this. God, I'm trusting you with it. I believe that it's under control. And sometimes that might be good enough. If it satisfies your soul, it's probably good enough. But if you carry that from the altar where you prayed with you, you better keep on praying. And you better get real with that prayer. Sister Susan talked something about that Wednesday night. About, huh, did you not? Number four is to pray constantly. Constantly. That means I'm in communication with the Father as much as possible. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul said to pray without ceasing. Now somebody says, that, how can I do that? Listen, when, when you're aware of God's presence and the fact that Holy Spirit indwells your heart, you can live a life of prayer. You can be in the business of communicating with your father. You know, if you, 
let's say it was my dad was still here and we were working on that building together, all right? Would we talk the whole time that we were working? Probably not. But would we talk most of the time that we were together? We probably would. We'd be saying, help me hold this. Bring me a nail. All right? I would be communicating with him because it's a father-son relationship. Sometimes we need to be on our knees pleading with God. That's supplication. That's fervent prayer. Sometimes we just need to be visiting with our dad. Father, how are you today? God, I'm glad that you're with me. Thank you, Lord, for life. Thank you that you woke me up this morning. Yes. Only where Samuel went, that's what he says yes, a lot. Yes. And you know what? Thank you, Lord, for waking me up this morning. Yes. I'm glad to be here. How about you? Yes. I'm aware of God's presence. I make a lot less mistakes. Yes. And if I'm talking to him because I know he's here, then I'm less likely to say something to somebody else that shouldn't be said. I'll keep the foot out of my mouth when I'm talking with God. And if I do put it in my mouth when I'm talking with God, God will pull it out. That's what chastisement is about. That's what correction is about. If we never communicate with God, we don't get chastised. We don't get corrected. There's very little repentance when people don't communicate with the Father because you haven't been scolded. You don't know that you got code on. And basically the church needs to repent because we've not communicated with our Father through prayer in a fashion that pleases Him. And I'm not going to say anything about how your prayer life sucks today. Good. And it's pathetic. That's for another sermon that was preached a long time ago. Because we haven't improved much over time. How many times during a week do we think, well, I should have prayed about that. I wish I'd talked with God about that. I bet God would have helped me there. Hmm, we do that a lot. Pray constantly. Number five, pray persistently. I'm telling you, don't quit until the answer comes. Now, in Luke chapter 18, there's eight verses over there that talks about this little women woman. And, it's, and listen, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Because there was this widow woman who was being mistreated. And she went to the judge, and the judge could care less. He didn't fear God, and he didn't care what happened to that widow woman. You know what she did? She kept going back. She get in his face every day. Say, what are you going to do about it, judge? Come on, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I need some relief. I need some help. You need to do something. And after a few days... He got tired of hearing her, looking at her face, being troubled. And you know what he did? He responded finally. She communicated unto him until he said, I've got to do something here because she ain't never going to leave me alone. You know what? Sometimes God just wants to see if you're willing to stand up to the test that you're under so that your faith can grow, so that you can believe God, so that God can work for you the way that he wants to. Sometimes we got to be persistent because another sermon, sometimes God answers yes, and sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says not yet. And when we pray persistently, he's not saying yes and he's not saying no, he's saying not yet. So keep praying. And sometimes when you keep praying, your prayer changes so that it fits into his will instead of your will. Because a lot of times we pray th ways and things that we didn't need to pray for. We didn't pray it in a way that God could respond. Sure, we want the Blues to win the Stanley Cup, do we not? Amen. But do you know that God's not going to change that? No matter how much we pray. And the Cardinals win the World Series again. We want that. Can we pray for them to win? We can pray all you want to, but God's going to say, the best team's going to win. Because somebody's neutralizing your prayer. They're praying for their team to win. So I don't care how persistent you are there, God's going to show you that you can't pray that way. So then he'll tell you, well, pray that the players will do their best. They'll have eyes that see the ball. Their gloves will have magnets to catch it. So you can begin to pray for the team 
so that they do their best, and if the best get beat, they got beat by somebody better. Amen? And then you'll feel good about it because they did their best. Sure, we wanted Bernie to win first in the state, did we not? But they came home winners anyway. On that day, they got beat by a better team by a couple points. They did their best. Don't quit. God's not into quitters. You hear me, guys? Don't quit. Keep believing God. You keep praying. God will respond to you. Have ears to hear. And let God work on your behalf. And then I'll tell you, well, there's one more I'll share today. Pray specifically. Learn how to pray specifically. 1 Samuel 1, chapter 27, Hannah was, she wanted a child. And she said, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. You know what she asked God for? She said, I want a son. She didn't say, I want a dog. She didn't say, I want a kid. She didn't say, I want a girl. She said, I want a son. She asked God specifically for what she wanted. God didn't give her something else. God gave her exactly what she wanted. See, we pray specifically. If I don't know how to do that, then let God teach me. God, how do I pray? God, what's best in this situation? God, how do I need to frame these words? closer we get in relationship with God, the better we learn how to pray. And Holy Spirit will begin to put the words in our mouth when we pray. He'll fine-tune a prayer when you're trusting Him and you're in relationship with Him. God will. When you pray for a raise and you get a nickel, are you going to complain? Most people say, I got a nickel. Well, what did you ask for? As for a raise. A nickel was a raise. There you go. Yeah, exactly. If you think you're worth a dollar more, say, God, I think I'm worth a dollar. Right. And if God says, son, you're worth 50 cents, then pray for 50 cents. Right. You hear me? Yeah. And you know what God will do? God will respond. God loves it when we pray specifically. That's why the more that we learn... How to pray, the better prayers that we become and the more answered prayers we receive, the more that we have. And there ain't nothing better than answered prayer. Amen. I'm telling you, nothing better. Praise reports, testimonies, witness to the world. Look what God has done. Who but God can do such things as these? But God cannot do these things until God's people Communicate with Him through prayer. Amen? All right, listen up, children. As you approach each day your battles, don't let your hearts faint. Fear not, do not tremble, neither be afraid. For the Lord our God is He that goes with us to fight for us against all of our enemies to keep us safe. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes His face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you his peace. Amen.